Hi everyone! This video is about mechanisms of microevolution. In class, we've been learning about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and how to determine if a population is changing over time. This video is an overview of the processes that cause those changes to occur. Let's start by reviewing the definition of microevolution which is a change in population's allele frequencies over short time periods, such as from one generation to the next. So if we take a look at this hippo population here, where the little circles inside each hippo represent alleles for hippo color, you can see that in this generation, the population has 70% green alleles and 30% blue alleles. In the next generation, they have 50% green alleles and 50% blue alleles. So from one generation to the next, the allele frequencies change. So we would say this population is not at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and it is evolving. So what's causing changes in allele frequencies? There are several different processes or mechanisms that could be working here, and you need to know six of them. They are natural selection, artificial selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. And in this video, we're gonna go into each one of these in more detail. So the first one we're going to look at is natural selection, which you've heard of before. This is also known as survival of the fittest. But what does fit mean in this context? It means organisms that are best adapted to survive in their specific environment. So it's determined by the environmental pressures that they're subject to. And this could be competition for resources, predator-prey interactions, climate, things like whether it's really hot or really cold or very wet or very dry, disease, and lots of other things too. So how does it actually work? Well, we did this a little bit last semester, so you may remember some of this. First thing we need is a population where we have variation between individuals, and that variation can arise via mutations or sexual reproduction. So here we have a population of mice, and you can see that we have some variation between individuals. They're not all the same color. The next thing we need is random mating and overproduction of offspring. Random mating just means that individuals can mate with whoever they like. There's no goal in mind. And in nature, populations tend to produce more offspring than the environment can support, hence overproduction of offspring. So here we have lots of mice being produced. Now there has to be some sort of struggle for survival, and that can be competition for resources, disease, predators, prey. In this case, the environmental pressure we're gonna look at is a predator. So here we have a bird that eats mice, and it's more likely to catch mice that don't blend into their environment. So it's gonna catch the light ones more frequently. And the best adapted individuals, in this case, the darker brown ones, are gonna be able to survive and reproduce. So what we're gonna see in the future is an increased frequency of beneficial alleles in subsequent generations. So if we come back and look at this population after two generations, we might see that there are more of the brown mice. There's a higher frequency of the allele coding for that darker coat color. What else do you need to know about natural selection? Well, it selects for or against only phenotypes. It doesn't know what an organism's genotype is. So if we go back to our hippo example, if green is completely dominant over blue, then the homozygous dominant genotype and the heterozygous genotype are gonna be equivalent in terms of natural selection. The process also cannot create new phenotypes. It can only edit based on what's already there. Natural selection is not directed or goal-oriented. It doesn't have some goal that it's trying to get to. And there is no universally ideal or most fit organism because what's fit is going to be different for each organism and environment. For example, what makes this polar bear fit in its environment is gonna be really different from what makes this desert lizard really fit in its environment. And finally, natural selection is the only evolutionary process that consistently leads to adaptive change where populations become better adapted to their environment over time. The next process we're gonna look at is artificial selection, which is selective breeding. So this is when selection occurs based on specific phenotype goals, where an outside force, such as humans, chooses which individuals get to reproduce and pass on their alleles. So this is not random mating. So here's an example, we've got a population of dogs and you can see that they're all different shapes and sizes. And maybe you want to create a population of dogs where they all have short legs and a long body. So that's our phenotype goal. So you would choose the individuals that have the shortest legs and the longest bodies and you would breed them together, do selective breeding. And after a few generations, you'd probably have a population of dogs where we have much higher frequencies of the alleles coding for short legs and a longer body. 
And this is exactly what we've done, and we've created a lot of different breeds of dogs this way, all shapes and sizes, by selecting for traits such as long legs or hairlessness. And humans do selective breeding with lots of different organisms, such as breeding racehorses to run fast, or breeding farm animals to produce lots of meat or milk, or breeding crops to produce more food. Classic example of this is corn, where the original natural uh, wild type of corn is fairly small, it has small kernels and not very many of them, but humans have been doing selective breeding of corn for thousands of years and now we've gotten to a point where we've got ears of corn that have lots of really big kernels on them. One thing to know about artificial selection is that it can sometimes be maladaptive, that prefix mal meaning bad. It can actually increase the frequency of alleles or traits that would reduce an organism's fitness in a natural environment. For example, we've been doing selective breeding of bulldogs to have this cute squished little face, but it actually makes it harder for them to breathe. They have a lot of breathing problems. And in German Shepherds, we breed for a lot of different traits, including these narrow sort of sloped hips. And it actually makes it so that many German Shepherds have trouble walking and can't walk at all when they get older. And if you look at this diagram here, it shows how chickens have changed over the last 60 years because we've been doing selective breeding for chickens that have lots and lots of meat on them. And now if you look at a typical broiler chicken, it's so big that it actually has trouble standing upright and walking. So all of these are examples of changes that would make it so these individuals would be less able to survive in a natural environment. The third process that causes microevolution is sexual selection. And this occurs when individuals choose their mates based on specific traits or behaviors. So another example of non-random mating. And there are two types of sexual selection. The first one is intrasexual selection, intra meaning within. And this is when individuals of one sex, usually it's the males, compete with each other to win mates, to win the right to mate with lots of females. So there's lots of examples of this in nature, including elephant seals and kangaroos fight with each other for mates, and antelope will fight using their horns for the right to mate with females. Females generally prefer to mate with the winners. The second type of sexual selection is intersexual selection, inter meaning between. This is also known as mate choice. And this is when one sex, usually the females, is choosy and they choose their mates based on attractiveness. And this attractiveness can be lots of different things. It could be bright colors, decorative features, or even singing songs or uh, performing dances. The classic example of this is a peacock. So you can see this peacock has this massive tail with all these brightly colored eye spots on it. And the males that have the biggest tails with the most spots generally get to mate with the most females because they really like those big fancy tails. In cardinals, females prefer the reddest males, the brightest males. And in paradise fish, females prefer males that have really big fancy fins and bright colors and stripes. But like artificial selection, sexual selection can actually encourage maladaptive traits. It requires extra energy to build a huge tail or sing an intricate song, and that's energy that could be used to escape from predators. Also, traits that females prefer may make males more susceptible to predation. So, for example, if an organism is brightly colored and therefore more visible. So here we have Mr. Peacock with his tail folded up, but even when he's not using it to impress a female, he still has to carry around that giant tail. So it's going to slow him down and make it harder for him to fly, so harder to get away from predators. And in these mandarin ducks, you can see the male has this beautiful coloration, but it makes him less camouflaged and more easily seen by predators. The fourth mechanism of microevolution is genetic drift. And this is a change in allele frequencies due to chance events. So it's not a selective process at all. And there's two types of genetic drift. The first one is a population bottleneck in which a drastic reduction in population size occurs due to some type of chance event. And we call it a bottleneck because we can illustrate it this way, where the population is getting forced through the narrow neck of a bottle and only a few individuals make it through. And this chance event that could cause this could be something like a natural disaster. So an earthquake or a fire or a tsunami, something where survival is based on chance alone. It has nothing to do with fitness. So here I have a population of dots and you can see there are different colors and there's a higher frequency of the alleles coding for this sort of peach color. But maybe something really terrible happens to this population and there's a big fire and most of the population gets wiped out and it has nothing to do with who is fit. It's just who is in the wrong place at the wrong time. And now as a result, 
in the survivors, we have a smaller gene pool. And you can see that the allele frequency here is different from what it was in the original population. And in the next generation, we might see that change carry on where you've got a higher frequency of the allele coding for the red color. The second type of genetic drift is the founder effect. And this is when an individual or a small group of individuals starts a new population. So it could be something like um, a few individuals migrating to a new location or going to an island where there weren't previously any members of that species. And the result is a smaller gene pool. You can see in the original population, we've got a, a fairly equal balance of purple and red individuals. And then in the small population that migrates somewhere else, starts a new population, we've got a different frequency of the alleles, higher frequency of the allele coding for a red color. So it may be different from the original population. The fifth mechanism of microevolution is gene flow, and this refers to immigration or emigration between populations. So it's when alleles move into or out of populations. And this can happen via fertile individuals or even just gametes moving between populations. So in this example, we have two populations of bugs, We've got the brown bugs and the green bugs. And if a brown bug moves to this population of green bugs, then it's going to change the frequencies of the alleles in that population. But this can happen even if an organism cannot move, if it can just send its gametes out into the world. So here we've got a pine tree, and you can see this little cloud coming off it. That's pollen. And pollen is essentially plant sperm. So if it's a very windy day, then the wind might carry that pollen over to a totally new population of pine trees where uh, it could introduce new alleles that that other population hasn't seen before. Here's another example of that. We have a coral living in the ocean and corals cannot move. So they just release their gametes out into the water. And if there's a really strong current that day, maybe those gametes will go and take their alleles to a totally new population of corals. The final mechanism of microevolution that you need to know is mutation, which we learned about a couple of months ago. So you remember that mutation refers to a random change in DNA that can create a new allele. So here I've got another population of red and beige dots, and maybe in the next generation, all of a sudden, a random change in the DNA creates this new allele coding for a green color. So when that happens, it's going to change the allele frequencies because now we've got this other allele in there changing the numbers. Now this is not a selective process. It's a random process where things can just pop up, but it can produce new phenotypes that are then subject to selective processes. So for example, maybe this green color makes that dot super visible to predators, and so it's not going to survive well. It's going to be weeded out of the population due to natural selection. Or maybe females really love that green color, and so they're going to mate with that green individual a lot, and that pop uh, excuse me, that allele is going to increase in frequency in the population due to sexual selection. But the initial mutation itself is not a selective process. So those are the six mechanisms of microevolution that you need to know. One more thing I should mention is that at any given time, most natural populations are experiencing two or three or even more of these processes. So it's not just one process at a time. Rather, all of these mechanisms work together to determine allele frequencies in a population. They all contribute to evolution. So that's it for now. Until next time, take care of yourself, take care of each other.